So I want to share with you um, your artistic talents. Um, that's an elephant. Looks a bit like a bear. This one was quite fun because they added some teeth to that one. It's a new type of elephant. I'm not quite sure if they've ever been to Africa to see an elephant. Um, not quite sure exactly what that is, but it looks a bit like a pig. But that was a good try. Really great try. We have a few which are a little bit closer. That, and they were wonderful to add some ears to it. This is a baby elephant where the trunk's not quite there quite yet. And here we have one with the trunk growing a bit more, kind of like an anteater, but we'll call that an elephant as well. And here was someone who said the big elephant in the room was competition. I think they figured it out, right? That was not a bad elephant. And then this one, which I thought was really quite cute, they're kind of missing the tail or the trunk was over here. And this one they said was people. Man. What was quite fascinating to me is all of them are aimed right. There's not a single elephant that I picked out of this little group which had a head heading left. And I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe we're all heading in the right direction. Oh, oh, oh. bad, bad, bad. So we have the great honor of having some very interesting and important individuals amongst us, and they're going to be coming up to stage in just a minute. The first, we're going to have the Danish minister, and then the minister from Korea, United Kingdom, and Ghana. Now, um, Minister for Business and Growth, Trolls Polson, and I was just asking him just a minute ago, I'm not sure how many of you know, in the design world, Polson lamps, Polson lights, one of the most beautiful lights in the entire world and guaranteed all of you have seen them and you might not know that Polson was a designer but he shares that name and uh, so I was quite excited about that. He has been Minister of Environment, Taxation, Education, Shadow, he was a Shadow Defense Minister and now the Minister of Business and Growth. He said the closest thing he had until now to do with the ocean was the swimming of Newfoundland dogs and going on, on vacation and a bit of sailing. But it is a great, great pleasure to welcome the new Minister for Business and Growth to the stage. Let us welcome uh, Minister Polson. <laughs> Sir. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure on behalf of the Danish government to welcome you all to the Danish Maritime Forum and also to Copenhagen. Denmark is a maritime nation by heart. For generations, Danes have sailed all over the world. Denmark was a leading maritime nation back when ships were built in wood and the goods were tea and sugar. And Denmark is still a leading maritime nation today when ships are high-tech, built in steel, and transport containers, iron, and oil. The maritime industry plays an important role in securing a better future for us all. It is the backbone of world trade and a cheap and clean form for transportation. Raw materials and consumer goods are shipped all over the world. It is said that 90% of all exports are transported by ship. The maritime industry is indeed a global industry. Therefore, it is influenced by global challenges, such as geopolitical crisis, demographic shifts, and changing patterns of production and consumption. At the same time, there is an increasing demand for energy efficiency transportation while the customers demand efficiency and cheaper prices. Luckily, being a global industry also means having global opportunities. New markets, new products and new technologies arise constantly. This uncertainty Whatever it good or bad demands greater cooperation, both across regions and borders and between the public and private sector. I will highlight three areas 
where I think we should focus our international cooperation. First, we must cooperate to ensure open markets and free trade. This is important for the efficient distribution of food, goods and energy all over the world. Human well-being and continued growth relies on goods being transported freely. Secondly, we must cooperate to ensure relevant international regulations and global enforcement. Without this, we risk that the safety of our seafarers and the protection of the marine environment is undermined. Thirdly, we must, we must ask ourselves, how can we ensure that the burdens we put on the maritime industry are not greater than the benefits we seek to obtain. We need to find the right balance and make room for the industry to find new solutions. Innovation is necessary if we want more efficiency, better protection of the environment, as well as cheap and safe transportation. And let me conclude saying that this is the second time that we host the Danish Maritime Forum here in Copenhagen. At last year's forum, it was stated that cooperation across the entire industry is necessary. And let me say I fully agree. This is why the Danish Maritime Forum is such an important event. We bring together people from the public sector, private sector, so we can exchange ideas and views. Let me thank you all for being here in Copenhagen. I wish you all a good and productive maritime forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you would grab a seat, you can choose. You're the first. There you go. Excellent. So next up is Minister Yu. Minister Yu is a, a lawyer by background, uh, completed his law degree is in New York. He's been on some pretty heavy-duty committees, the Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee, Judiciary Reform, Committee on Climate Change, Agriculture, Maritime, Fisheries, and the National... He keeps going on and on and on. And today, as a Minister of Oceans and Fisheries, you're going to share some thoughts with us. So please let us welcome Minister Yu. Thank you. Thank you. You want to... Thank you. Yeah. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to address this distinguished audience at this annual Danish Maritime Forum. The Danish Maritime Forum uh, 2015 comes with great significance since we are at this critical jun juncture faced with the major issues in the international maritime area. I'm deeply honored to deliver the keynote speech on behalf of the Korean government at this meaningful occasion taking place in Copenhagen, especially in this country familiar with the Korean people for the famous author and for it Hans Christian Andersen and his fairy tale, The Little Mermaid. My pronunciation is okay? <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, this might somewhat sound like a cliche, but let's once again think about the role of the shipping in the global economy. Adam Smith, the political economist and author of the Wealth of Nations described the maritime trade as the, the principal stepping stone of the economic development. Had it not been for the maritime transport services to the mankind, the trading activities and economic development would not have been achieved. However, while the global shipping industry has advanced based on the principle of a free and open market, 
and made significant contribution to the world economy, the industry is now sensed as risky and unattractive. What makes the matters worse is that due to the recent prolonged economic recession, the shipping industry has gone through a structural changes which will possibly bring tough challenges to the future shipping industry. In, in the container shipping industry particularly, the ships are turning into mega ships, having capacity of over 18,000 TUs. And new type of strategic alliance are being formed everywhere. In reality, the market is uh, gradually becoming concentrated to a minority of the influential shipping companies. The strategies read by these small number of leading shipping companies are treating because the shipping company of the each country are served as a backbone of the maritime transport industry. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to overcome the potential threats shadowing the global shipping market and enable the shipping industry to support the global economy and pursue sustainable development, we must take collective efforts. First and foremost, I believe that it is a critical time for the international community to describe, to deliberate the possibility of the consequences we might face caused by the operation of mega ships and excess supply of the tonnage by leading shipping companies. In the short term period, it might seem beneficial to custom, customers and consignees, but we, it will gradually drive out small and mid-sized companies, and in the long run, it will sway the foundation of sustainable development of the shipping industry, including mega shipping companies themselves. This will remind us that the mammoths and dinosaurs became extinct due to the shortage of food in ancient times. We cannot rule out the possibility that this will ultimately bring uncertainty to not only the global economy, but also clients and shippers. Second, the maritime transport industry must exercise our respons responsibility to stay eco-friendly and to protect the environment and health of the people. With the, the surging volume of the global trade and the ever-growing maritime transport market, the pollution from ships and port operations are taking heavy toll on the health of people and environment. Therefore, we must develop a new kind of pure oils for ships with low, low, lower greenhouse gas emission than the current ones we are using, and provide them at the affordable prices to the shipping companies. We should also develop new technologies in ship engines for the reduction of air emission. Third, considering the present situation, we must induce the gross potential of the shipping industry. In the long term perspective, potential factors that can challenge the transport system of Eurasian regions are detected. China is putting forward the new Silk Road strategy, which is connected with the inland development, and Russia is also speeding up to come up with efficient transportation system. Korea is working on uh, making the same kind of effort as well. We are seeing future growth potential from Arctic area due to the global warming. The number of days vessels can operate through northern sea routes is increasing. 
So the Northern Sea Route holds competitive advantage over other alternative routes, especially in the terms of the transportation, energy, and um, min mineral resources. This is why we are looking more actively in exploiting the Northern Sea Route or Arctic Sea. Against this, uh, this backdrop, we are expecting to witness structural challenges in the global transportation systems. Therefore, we need to think about discussing on redesigning network among the shipping companies. In the meanwhile, we are nowadays enjoying the trend of boundless consumption, internet basis, overseas direct purchase. We, ca we can simply say ODP. And if we interconnect this trend with the growth potential of shipping, it becomes pretty clear that the shipping companies should expand their range of services. We should actively examine possible measures to go beyond the current port-to-port -port services and actively introduce the door-to-door -door services. The government should abolish the regulations that are hindering the development of multimodal services so that the global shipping company can constructively move forward. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that many experts and professionals, policy makers in the shipping arena should pull their wisdom and knowledge, share their thought and information in order to come up with a proper solution for overcoming the complicated obstacles and the difficulties the global shipping industries are currently faced with. I would like to express my highest appreciation to all the distinguished participants and to tell those who have strived to organize this forum. I wish the best of luck and happiness to all of you here today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, <clears throat> excuse me, next up, we have Mr. Goodwill. It's a pleasure to have you bring you up to the stage. And you can't, no one could probably speak about multimodality better as the Under Secretary of State for the Department of Transport, under which I believe you have responsibility for not just ports, but a few other things as well, if I might be mistaken, but I think I might be right. But the interesting thing when we look at your pedigree is you have been a farmer since 1979. And we can talk about that at dinner, perhaps at the opera. But it's a, again, when we think about all the goods moving, the food, all the things that we have to move from point A to B. Here's a man who can share with us his thoughts. Mr. Goodall, please join the stage. Good man. Thank you. Yep. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed and, and good afternoon. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here in Copenhagen, particularly as um, this week, it's the Council of Transport Ministers for the EU in Luxembourg, and there was some debate as to whether I should go to Luxembourg or Copenhagen. Uh, the good news is my boss, the Secretary of State, is in Luxembourg this week, and I'm here in Copenhagen, so I think I, I certainly got the, the best part of the deal. And it's a great to see so many global maritime leaders here today. In fact, some of you uh, I saw uh, just over a month ago at the London International Shipping Week. We can discuss the challenges facing the sector, and of course, as a politician, it is always tempting to promote one's own national maritime industries. And with the World Bank rating the UK as one of the easiest countries in the world to do business, with our highly competitive tonnage tax regime, our world-leading maritime business services and our skilled workforce, and also our efficient and successful ports, our prestigious flag, it would be easy for me to say that whatever the challenges ahead, the UK offers a safe port of call for international maritime businesses to grow and thrive. However, I will resist that temptation <laughs> and will address the issues at hand, namely the challenges facing the sector as a whole and what we can do to meet them. By 2030, sea trade is predicted to double. 
Already over 80% of global trade is moved by ship. So with trade so reliant on the maritime sector, the real challenge is how we prepare for growth. Our maritime industries have a great opportunity. Over recent decades, we have seen the power of international trade as it has improved international living standards and lifted millions out of poverty. Now the maritime industry can be at the forefront of a new era of growing world trade and rising prosperity. So how must we meet this challenge? Consider the sophistication of modern shipping with its complex supply chains, its just-in-time logistics and its endless movement of millions of containers around the globe. No government could design such a system, let alone manage it or indeed improve it. It is a product of the market in the digital age. And it is to the market that we must turn if we are to meet the challenges and opportunities of the decades ahead, whether they are technological, economic or environmental. We must expect market, the market to deliver the solutions and at the same time, we must guard against protectionism and overzealous regulation, which serve only to stifle dynamism and innovation. But that does not mean that governments are relieved of responsibility because the market will always be imperfect, perhaps focusing on the immediate future rather than the longer term. And in such cases, the government and the industry must work together to design regulations that support the maritime sector, that promote competition, that protect maritime workers, that promote maritime safety and keep shipping secure, as well as protecting the marine environment the international nature of shipping entails that many of these issues are global in nature. Radically different rules for different parts of the world rarely make sense. Growth of the kind predicted for global sea trade can only be frustrated by perverse incentives, inefficiency and increased cost called by rival regulatory regime, regimes. So we must ensure that in the years ahead we support effective international law if the sector is to meet the opportunities created by growth in world trade. So in conclusion, global shipping stands at the threshold of an era of unparalleled growth in world trade. In recent decades, the shipping industry has shown its spirit of innovation and enterprise. And in coming decades, that spirit will be called upon again. Governments can hinder or they can help, but no government can replace the power of the free market, free enterprise and private capital in its ability to deliver prosperity and opportunity for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And last but no way least, we have jo the minister from Ghana, Joyce Bawa Mokhtari. She is also a lawyer. I'm sort of scared to be on stage with all these smart law people. Um, United Nations Commission on International Trade, Convention of Carriage of Goods, and is pushing me off the stage so you can get the word. <laughs> there you go, girl, thank you. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues from the Republic of Ghana who are here with me this afternoon, I bring you felicitations from the country of gold, the country of cocoa, and the country that produced our first president, Dr. Osajefo Kwame Nkrumah. Ghana, indeed, like several other persons gathered here, is likewise a coastal state. And as the Americans say, when you look on the map of the global world, you'd find Ghana in the bulge of that map. It's a small country of about 25 million people, but because of our maritime prowess, our human resource capacity, our raw materials such as gold and cocoa, we do have quite a place in the world stage. But of course, in terms of our outlook as far as maritime transport is concerned, we do have some challenges that need addressing. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it appears that there's been some economic improvement in the development of countries such as ours. This we have achieved through partnership agreements amongst ourselves and of course, with regards to initiatives in strengthening investment opportunities. Increased demand for consumer goods by developing countries such as ours and the increased export of primary products has also boosted this improvement in the economies of developed nations. On the other hand, stunted economic growth 
in developing countries and of course the rising socio-political unrest around the world constitute a giant douse looming around to dampen this progress being made worldwide. The maritime transport system has several subsectors, like the liner trade, the dry and liquid bulk, container transportation, and car carrier in what of you. Most of these subsectors would actually also have microcosms such as crude, grain, products, and what have you. We do have all these divisions, including our ferry and passenger transportation services. Other elements of this all-important transportation include national ports and harbors operations, maritime transportation, security mechanisms, and of course, the legal regimes such as international and guidelines, as well as conventions that guide this all-important trade. The sector has in recent times seen some growth in its operations, though international trade tends to waver around a downward trend, which has been you know, observed since 2013. According to the review of maritime transportation in 2014, increases in the dry bulk trade contributed towards 2013 world seaborne trade volumes reaching about 9.5 million tons. Other factors that have affected the trade volume included the continued high supply of world fleet, over demand and of course high banker prices, which led to slow steaming of vessels. The bulk trade continues to dominate the maritime trade industry, especially the dry bulk cargo trade, which seems to fuel the growth in trade. The modest growth in the world economy during the 2013 review period has led to an increase in the world fleet to over at least 1.69 billion deadweight tons in 2014. This was made up of about 42% of bulk carriers, 28% of tankers, and about 12% of container ships. The highest capacity was in the dry bulk area, where demand in terms of order books continue to fulfill their deliveries. According to Moody's, the supply of shipping vessels has outstripped demand as a result of slow economic growth and the continued delivery of new orders. Moody's also indicates that this capacity glut will continue over the next few years as freight rates remain the same and stable, though it will vary from sector to sector. Countries such as Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, and Singapore continue to register the highest fleets flying their flags. A development of vital concern to us as developing countries is the emergence of all these cellular ships without gears. As the size of these vessels increase, and I believe this morning we heard about all the supermax, the Panamax, and what have you, what this means is that ports in developing countries must by all means develop and rise to meet modern trends in this all-important global sea trade. We are expanding rapidly, and we do hope that these expansion projects would at least be of benefit mutually to us, not just as a nation or within the sub-region, but of course have an international and global impact as well. Oil transportation has also seen a more or less stable growth in 2013 as a result of our stable performances of the world economies, coupled with high oil price levels and, of course, changes in supply and demand, which have truly reduced the cost of crude, especially for new nascent oil-producing countries such as ours. The trends continue to show that this time last year, crude prices actually are much lower now than anybody expected. In 2013 also, the container trade reached about 651 million TEUs, moving by more than 5%. The major movement of all these containers was within the Asian ports community, with developing countries in Africa, Europe, and the Far East taking up the rest. In the freight market, freight rates have actually declined substantially in all subsectors of this all-important industry. So performances are not as good, especially in developing economies. This has also led to us developing strategies like operational cooperation, consolidations amongst other operators, alliances, and of course, replacement of smaller vessels by older, wider, and bigger ones. And of course, we also want to make our trade more fuel efficient. All these changing changes taking place within the maritime transport sector definitely have implications for our industry. According to the Economist Intelligence of 2012, quoted in the review of maritime transport in 2014, sub-Saharan Africa is to see much growth from 2014 onwards. This is as a result of expansion in the domestic markets of the region as a large proportion of the population 
joins the lower income brackets. There are also lots of investment interests in the region due to the booming resource sectors, infrastructure development, and the growing consumer demand. The IHS Maritime Fair Play of 2014 has projected that investments in port infrastructure and the construction of new ones could surpass the 10, 10 billion levels in the next five years, and that this could result in increased income of a substantial level for households and thus increases in consumption. It is expected that the growth in trade pattern within the region will move towards higher levels. This is one of the aspirations for which the heads of state of Africa have actually set up to exploit this all-important African maritime domain for the benefit of the peoples. This must also be taken into account when we talk about this new effort, which is the integrated maritime strategy to propel this all-important objective. This should at least serve to increase intra-Africa trade, leading to increased maritime transport activities within the continent. On the global scale, the shipping industry is set to see even more growth, even though it's actually on a cautious note. Strong expansions in the bulk trade, especially LNG, coal and iron ore, are expected to fuel this growth. Yet the growth envisaged in the developed economies is likewise fragile. That of the emerging economies has many difficult turns, and there are geographical tensions that could escalate and bring derailment to this all-important industry on a global level. On the whole, the maritime transport industry has great and immense potential for the future in terms of our job creation efforts for our theming youth of the world in oil and gas industry, architecture and facility youth management, marine engineering, information and communication technology, banking, shipping, insurance, the possibilities are endless. The potential income generation of the sector has been obvious for many, many years, yet it is difficult to know how to tap into it in a manner that will bring lasting benefit to us all. Key players have requested a shift in the operations and mindset, especially with regards to developments in developing countries. This is important since growth cannot come about with only a desire to make profits. There is the need to ensure that the wealth is equitably distributed and taking into consideration the fact that the resources that bring about wealth are not located in only one place. Africa is indeed efficient and needs an efficient railway system to connect its ports to the cities inland. This is essential to efficient port operations and transport. And I'm sure that one of the key things we have discussed this morning have been about connectivity, intermodal connectivity, and of course, technological connectivity. If we also have data network exchanges, that will even make it even more easier for us to run efficient ports and what have you. For us in Ghana, I believe that we have actually taken the lead. We are working arduously to expand our ports and of course to develop our infrastructure to meet growing demand. It is instructive that we are here in the beautiful city of Copenhagen today, where Mesk Line has in recent times made a single largest investment in the development of our port infrastructure. This portends well for the industry in the long term, and we hope that other private partnerships will develop in that regard and that this all-important industry would go a long way to reduce poverty, to create jobs, and of course, open up even more investment opportunities for us all in this globally sensitive industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. I have pages of notes here, and what I'd like to start with a few questions, and if we have a bit of time, uh, towards the end, I'm gonna try to get us back on schedule. There's an opportunity for a couple of you guys, for y'all, that's an American term saying you, plural, um, to ask some questions. So if you feel like you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, you need to catch my eye, and uh, I'll see if we can slip it in there. So, um, Minister Polson, you talked about um, uh, free market international regulation burdens and benefits. I think that burdens and benefits it probably hits a, hits a tone with everybody in the room trying to understand what that is and how we mean it. Can you kind of d dig into that a little bit more about what you mean by that and how you see that moving forward for, for, for us uh, from your ministry or, and, your, and your thoughts? Yeah, I can try. Um, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, I have been minister for, for the environment uh, previous in my political career. And I think in, in Denmark, when we're talking about in environment, we have had a huge ambition being in the forefront. 
but but sometimes being in the forefront uh, that is uh, it's quite heavy for for the companies living here in, in Denmark so of course we have to try to invent new solutions but the companies that have to to deal with that uh, should also be able to 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 pay for it and, and then should also be uh, competitive so when we are talking about uh, burdens. I think we we have also to see it in in the way that the companies should be able to implement these uh, solutions. So that that's in fact the way I see it. Mm-hmm. And w- is there anything you're you're planning on doing? Like so, the, like you also mentioned, sort of cooperation is key between uh, both. I'd say all all the parties. So is there anything that you can be thinking that you would be encouraging t- so that these these parts come together or? You know, this is, and this, it, the cooperation has been a theme, mm. and I'm going to pass this on to all of you, actually, this idea of this cooperation. If we're open for response, you don't have to. Is there anything you can share with us that uh, your ministry might be doing to encourage this over the next, you know, in the next uh, year or so, two years, three, four, five? Uh, I think, in, in fact, also to, to be polite uh, for the government that was be- before me, uh, mm. I'm not... Uh, Admiring them that at, at uh, so much I can say, but well, you're the but, other but, party, but, so but, you're not but, supposed but, to admire but, but them. But let me know. be honest. Then uh, <laughs> they had, had, in fact, uh, taking some very good uh, polit- political steps concerning uh, that they would like to involve uh, different maritime organizations in talking about what should the future be for the maritime industry in Denmark, mm. and uh, I'll carry on doing that and I, th- I think that's a that's a good I- good idea talking from uh, from a national perspective yeah that's really that's really great anyone else want to respond to that mr goodall yeah, I mean, if you want any uh, evidence to show just how the free markets can deliver you know go to south korea and then actually on the second note, don't go to north korea uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and that shows i think most dramatically how a free market <coughs> can deliver prosperity and jobs and growth, and the alternative is just not an option. Indeed, you know, uh, to a lesser extent, the same is true across even European Union countries, where countries like the UK have cut te- business taxation, have cut regulation, and we've created jobs. Uh, other countries have been slightly more protectionist of their own uh, vested interests, and they've not created jobs. Um, we've just published our maritime growth study, which has identified areas that we need to make progress, and being competitive is one of them. Uh, addressing the skills gap I- is another one. And also, we- we're, we're quite um, open about it, our um, UK shipping register has not been as responsive to its customers as it should have been, and we're going to fix that as well. Uh, we have an international uh, market in terms of where you flag your vessels, and we'd be delighted for you to come to the UK so we can demonstrate to you how we can improve the service that we've been giving. So you're open for business too. You're at Egypt and Panama open, and you're ready and gone. So we're all open for business, which is good. Anyone else want to comment on that, or can I move over? Okay, so um, Mr. Yu, yeah. part of the cooperation and collaboration also leads towards innovation. And uh, you in, in your nation have some of the largest shipbuilding yards. Yes, yeah. yeah, three major ones. Yeah, and so you, as a as a as a group, you could impact the world quite seriously with the innovations you could be encouraging to occur. But this is also as um, as a regulator, you know what what you know what support do you think that are you, are you giving towards innovation? You know, are you are you pushing it? Are you encouraging it? Is it uh, around that, that domain of innovation? Any thoughts on that? Yes, we have uh, many thought uh, about that, uh, but the, as uh, as I'm the in charge of the, the maritime business and uh, shipping companies in Korea, uh, as I told my keynote speech, yep. um, we are very worried about the uh, uh, some companies such as Hyundai Hanjin is right now facing with uh, uh, mega ships operating by. Uh, some the international companies, uh, especially in European uh, com- companies. So uh, we think the, uh, the this kind of trend will uh, give uh, the market is uh, endless competition uh, between the uh, the shipping companies. So we we want to right now the 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 allocation of the. Um, 
uh, some the allocation of the uh, our future business to every possible the shipping companies all over the world. Yeah, rather than the consolidation, but that's sort of. If the, if the free market works, then that should sort of work out. We, so we still uh, advocate the, a uh, free market, but the, if the ship size is going uh, beyond the, uh, our affordable the size, such as the 22,000 uh, TU, then the, uh, there is no suitable the port facilities in the world. The, mm. For instance, the, mm. uh, the Busan New Port right now want to remoderate the uh, for the vessel over 22,000 uh, TU vessels, but the, it seems to us it's uh, kind of the impossible to uh, re remodel the, our uh, port facility more than 22,000 uh, TU container vessels. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me ask um, Joyce, when you've got the, this integrated strategy, is that including so these, these ship sizes? Or can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, are you already planning for the 25,000 TUs? Well, actually, it's actually one of the key reasons what? why we've actually undertaken this very aggressive port infrastructure expansion. Remember that we don't have a naturally very good draft. Hmm. So what it means is that to be able to receive these new uh, fuel efficient and uh, economically more efficient vessels, we would need deeper berths and, of course, to widen the anchors leading it to the ports. So yes, one of the key reasons has been the modern trends, modern vessels, and of course the fact that Ghana is just at the verge of also becoming an oil producing country. It meant that we required some very <coughs> wider berths. We needed a new jetty. We also needed to expand the port facility in particular. For those of you who have been to Tema, you would know that because it was actually built so many years ago, there's been a lot of you know, development Mm. offshore mm. but very close to the port infrastructure so what we have done over the years is to go for some very aggressive reclamation so that we can create additional space and all of these are actually geared towards one expanding the port facility two for us to be able to invite all these larger vessels which is why it is interesting that mesk line a company that has traded in ghana for many many years actually decided to come into this uh private partnership arrangement with the government and people of Ghana to be able to develop our port facilities to meet growing demand. So the, the public-private partnership to help the owners actually enter into the strategy. And if we, do we see the, the PPP being part of your strategies and, and the other for port and infrastructure development? This is just curious what do you guys think. Well, well, certainly in the UK, we, we privatised most of our ports and we see investment coming into the UK from the private sector. Uh, our view is that if the private sec sector can deliver infrastructure, then it should do so. And uh, we would encourage uh, other nations around the world to look at uh, the model. You know, we've got the new London Gateway port. Uh, DP World have come in, put that investment in, and we've got a, you know, more com competition in the container business in, in the UK, which can only mean more competitive rates for those who wish to ship. And um, indeed, talking about innovation generally, I think there's tremendous potential for uh, more environmental innovation. I think that the key tasks that we'll have to set uh, the world shipping industry is how to improve its environmental performance, how to uh, reduce um, sulfur and nitrogen oxide gases, how to improve the recyclability of, of ships, and indeed, how we need to, I think, in the same way that we're looking at aviation, move to a, a global uh, market-based system of emissions trading to enable uh, reductions in, in CO2, which can be achieved elsewhere, uh, to be transferred to other areas such as aviation and shipping, where it's more difficult uh, to reduce those emissions. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens in Paris and if we can actually move that forward a bit. That would be, be quite... Are there any questions from the floor? Because I, I can keep going up here. But I want to see if anyone else out. Did anyone else have a? Here's a question up. There's one up here. Anyone else have a have a question they'd like to ask? Remember, hard on ideas, soft on people. Right? <laughs> These are everyone heard and agreed. Everything with everything. Let's, you have a microphone we can bring up here. I've got one right here. I can throw at you. Can you catch? Yeah. Oh, you're 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 looking at your notes. No one else wants to ask a question. There's another one right there. Okay. Can we have another mic come right down here? And introduce yourself, please, sir, to the ministers. And then nobody else. Good, good afternoon. I'm Ravi Marotra, Chairman of Foresight London. My question is to Mr. Yu from Korea, Shipyard. 
we have seen the growth in the size of the ships building over the last 30 years, which is driven by the ship owners for their own efficiency to bring down the cost. But we have not seen the shipyards in the world doing research to improve the efficiency of the ships, overall efficiency. I want to know what Korean government is doing because most of the shipyards do not have the, that much financial power to do this research. We have very little advancement in the efficiency of the ships. Thank you. Good question. I'm going to actually let anyone on the panel answer that. Thank you very much, sir, about what are we doing on the, on the land side. Yes, please, sir. Yeah. The, uh, uh, we are still considering the, which kind of the uh, uh, financial attitude is uh, suitable or not. The, some year ago, the, the, I mean the past one decade, uh, Korean government is doing financing to the uh, shipbuilders in the, uh, uh, usually the uh, three major shipbuilders in Korea uh, to build uh, any kind of vessels, uh, including uh, mega ships. Uh, I'm saying the, uh, uh, including uh, 22,000 TU vessels. But the, after the, we see that this kind of mega vessel is operating uh, Busan port and other major ports in Shanghai or the Singapore, we, we saw if the vessel size is uh, bigger than uh, 22 or 25,000 TU, uh, we want to face uh, lots of the uh, inefficiency uh, in the uh, port facilities. So nowadays, we, 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 we will have uh, the detailed discussion uh, between shipbuilders and the port operators and the government, and which one is uh, most suitable for the future the uh, uh, shipping business. So uh, in, in, in short, the, uh, our government, government attitude is not, dis not uh, decided, but the, we're going to decide in, in the near future which one is good for the, uh, the future financing or future shipping business. But, but can I, let, let, well, let's, let's, let's let him continue to, Minister Paulson, you wanted to respond? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, make a short statement about what we are doing in Denmark, where we are not uh, able to build those big ships anymore here in Denmark. Uh, that's, that's a shame, but, but what we have learned from what, what has been going on the last 25 years, turning into a, a green country here in Denmark is that we have done a lot to support private companies and uh, public private uh, sector programs to support some of the, the new energy solutions, also environmental solutions. And uh, that has in fact been a, a great success in, in some areas. But now uh, we have also seen that, that some of the new green solutions has, has uh, quite a, a potential problem because of the oil price, because uh, it's not that uh, costful anymore. So I, I think it is from, from our uh, lessons learned here in Denmark uh, necessary that all the knowledge we have from, from the public sector, we also try to give that to, to the private sector. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's a difficult task. Yeah, which is an interesting thing because it brings up, just to follow on for that, the short term versus long term. Yeah. Because right? I think none of us in this room would have imagined that oil prices were going to be where they are right now, or fuel prices. At this point last year, we probably, I could have made a mint if I had bet that <laughs> with you, but we didn't. So it's very interesting, and we all believe probably it's going to go back up, but who knows? That's sort of a, a physical and political question. And it's that short term versus long term, and the role of government versus private enterprise. And I think there's another question I want to ask back to you. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to you've got to keep going. I'm sorry. The question has not been answered. <laughs> uh, the question wasn't answered. Well, he, you know, he got around it, and uh, let's just. Uh, <laughs> 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 I forget we're politicians. <laughs> We've got four politicians up here, Ravi. So you're going to <laughs> <laughs> talking of the ships designing efficiency. Yeah. Because as today, it will not like to sit with a 30 year old car because the efficiencies have moved on. Yeah. 
shipping, it has not moved on. That's my question. So the shipping hasn't moved on, but the, the ships have. The overall efficiency of the shipping, uh, the ship uh, design has not moved on. There is no fuel efficiency in this. People talk fuel efficient, 4 or 5 percent, but they really, it needs the shipyards to do the investment to research on that. Okay, I'm going to let that hang. We're going to we're going to put that as a challenge to the whole whole room about uh, 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 on that one. Unless someone, Robert, go ahead. Uh, I mean, obviously, one of the problems we face with uh, innovation in terms of vehicle technology, whether it be cars, ships, aircraft, whatever, is the life cycle of that particular asset and how long it is before it's replaced. So, if it's a car, it's what 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, if it's an aircraft, 25 years or more shipping, in some cases, even longer. I, you know, the recent uh, sinking in the U.S., a 40-year-old ship that went down. So it's absolutely right that the, the, the speed of replacement of the fleet can uh, affect the way that t today's environmental performance can then be uh, spread across the sector. I, I think one of the other problems that I, I think the media has made this mistake, if you've been following the Volkswagen situation, is there's great confusion between CO2 performance and other environmental performance of vehicles. And indeed, the reason that the um, uh, exhaust uh, catalytic systems were turned off on the Volkswagen cars was to improve the fuel efficiency in terms of CO2. And there is a trade-off because, you know, you either remove the sulfur at the refinery, which has an energy cost, or you remove the nitrogen oxides uh, in the uh, exhaust system of the vessel. That, again, will have a cost in terms of fuel. So there is always a trade-off between the environmental performance in terms of noxious gases and the environmental performance in terms of CO2. And it's something I think the media just don't seem to understand at all. They seem mm. to lump it all together. But the, it's a, a, a complex situation. And the more we do in terms of cleaning up emissions in one way, the less we can then do in terms of cleaning up the CO2 effects of vehicles. And we're going to see again, we'll come back to the, you know, the next few months. It's going to be quite interesting. I want to ask all of you uh, a, a very uh, a sort of a question because we're, we're butting up against the end of the, the time. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to kind of cut. What, you know, here we have, again, as I asked, as I said, with, our, with our, our, our canal leadership, an amazing group of individuals. Is there, um, is there a way you could suggest to us, or what would, what would you like to know from this group? What would you, if you could get the collective wisdom is there, is there one or two things that you would like to know from this group that we could share with you that would help you as ministers move ahead and create your agenda that, uh, that would be a benefit for all of us? And Joyce, if, do you um, have a... Um, thank you very much. I would actually uh, want to ask, in terms of developing our port infrastructure, what really are we looking at in terms of the future? Are we looking at developing environmentally friendly ports? Are we looking at developing greenhouse ports? Are we also looking at creating ports for consumers? Because in my personal experience, what I've realized is that most times the policy is to develop port infrastructure, mostly because of profit. But whether or not in all of these coastal countries, the emphasis is on the consumer and just what that mm. particular consumer is looking for. I think it feeds into the gentleman's question about what types of ships we're building for the future, whether we are looking at building environmentally friendlier ones, whether we're making efforts. But I think that is also the responsibility of key stakeholders to provide some recommendations on one, what sort of ports we want for the next 20, 30 years. Secondly, what types of ships we envisage to have in the coming years and how we can also develop, finally, a sustainable legal framework. First, to ensure maritime safety and security, and of course, secondly, to fully integrate our port systems. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Robert? Well, the UK government is, is very keen to uh, deregulate, to re remove barriers to international trade, and to make progress, uh, particularly in terms of the transatlantic uh, trade uh, agreements. And I suppose the, the question I would ask is, um, bearing in mind that whatever we do, it's got to be done internationally, 
Uh, there's no way that uh, individual nations or even blocks of nations like the European Union can do these things uh, unilaterally in an international global market. Where can we deregulate? Where can we remove those barriers? And how can we help you uh, to develop those international uh, trade connections which uh, promote employment and uh, other uh, social uh, improvements in countries around the world that can benefit from free trade? Excellent. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, the, it's very difficult to give you a uh, Solomon's wisdom to <laughs> any kind of the, uh, the resolutions made. Uh, you know, the, we have uh, lots of the complicated uh, interest in, uh, in choosing which one is uh, suitable or not. For instance, the, uh, if we focus on the just ship builders business, we encourage that just vessels will be built uh, in uh, Korean shipyard or any other shipyard in the world. But if we go to the, uh, the uh, hard competition between the uh, uh, shipping companies, we will reconsider the, our previous uh, resolution. So it's very difficult to say which one is correct or which one is uh, affordable. But the uh, one good wisdom is uh, we must listen to every parties who, have, who are interested in shipping business. Uh, that's uh, what the Korean the government is doing right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And you started off with the first word, and you get the last. Yeah, thank you. I'll do it quite short. I, I totally agree with my British uh, colleague about uh, regulation. I think the question should be, is it possible to make uh, smart regulation uh, internationally? Deep breath. And I believe one of the groups is going to be focusing on that. And we keep this in mind. So with that, we will draw this to a, to a I have to, I, I'm going to have to keep it to, to time, my friend. I'm so sorry. I, I'm, um, Thank you for this. Um, and clearly there are questions which are still in the room and uh, the ministers are gonna be going off along with two others to a, uh, two or three others to a little, um, have some time to themselves to do things which ministers do. I'm not exactly sure what you guys do. So, you know, um, not, but no seriousness to have a chance to talk about some of these issues which we, you have asked and we have been talking about this morning. And then that's really fantastic. You are going to have to go back to work in the other room. And you're going to go back to the groups where you started, and you will find some new instructions at each wall. And so with that, can we please thank our esteemed panel for their time and their wisdom.